I would like to talk about computer code as DNA and the ability of blockchain to help us evolve institutions. And of course, I'm, I'm going to be talking about an evolutionary environment with an ecosystem of institutions, where institutions include large firms, small firms, regulatory bodies, educational institutions, all of that. But first, I'd like to just start by talking about code as DNA. And code can include really anything that would be written on a blockchain. So it includes things like algorithms and constitutions, like the rules that, that make up roles and incentives within an institution. And it can include just plain information of any type. So um, to, to think about code as DNA, I think it is helpful to rewind to, say, the late 1990s, early 2000s, when you had computer programmers who were developing the internet. And they created code that would show you websites, that would create a user interface, that would allow you to purchase things from the website. And as you might imagine, some of that code was kind of buggy. Like, there were parts of the code that made it difficult to click through to other sites on the website, that sort of slowed down the process of purchasing things on the website. And what happened, of course, is the code that was well-written and efficient, that code perpetuated into the future because coders don't always start coding from scratch. A lot of times they'll look through existing code, they'll copy and paste the stuff that's working, and they'll just update the parts of that code that are slow or buggy or that are causing problems at the moment. And this is, of course, analogous to DNA because DNA is the code, the instructions in our genetics and in the genetics of all plants and animals and fungus and all that that sort of tells, uh, that gives the instructions for expression of characteristics in that organism, for expressions of instinctive behavior and traits. It, like all of sort of how successful a species is going to be depends on their DNA. And how evolution happens, of course, is the DNA that's really adapted to the environment, that's really effective at, you know, causing this organism to reproduce and succeed and spread their genes further, um, that DNA will get perpetuated into the future. Whereas these mutations that end up being uh, weak and causing problems with the organism such that they're weaker in their environment or less likely to produce, those bits of the DNA eventually get dis displaced by stronger types of DNA through the evolutionary selection process. So there's strong analogies there between the way code perpetuates or gets displaced and the way genes that are uh, well suited to the environment or poorly suited to the environment eventually get displaced or propelled into the future. Now, how does this apply to institutions? And when I'm talking about institutions, it's a lot of different types of institutions. So regulatory bodies, firms, educational institutions, platforms, I think are going to be an important one, markets, and platforms, of course, are any online website that is a place for people to come together and exchange and talk about ideas and all of that. So these are like foundational institutions in our society, and they certainly exist in an ecosystem where these institutions are on one hand separate from each other, but they have relationships, they communicate, they affect each other, and therefore I think the biology example of sort of DNA and evolution actually works well um, with institutions because institutions can succeed well, they can do a good job of their mission, or they can fail in a variety of ways. And when they fail, they sort of lose out in the evolutionary environment. So what about blockchain? Why, why do I think blockchain is so essential in this evolutionary environment to actually strengthening the way uh, the way institutions evolve. Okay, so if we're thinking about code as DNA in this 
institutional environment. There's going to be three big categories of things that you could put on a blockchain, things that you could code into these institutions that will be important. And the first is going to be algorithms, of course, where algorithms are I mean, obviously, they are what determines your news feed in a social media company's uh, space. And here we're talking about many different types of algorithms. So the one I talk about a lot on this channel is the social media algorithm that determines what you see, what information actually reaches your eyes through your news feed. And it's both personalized to you, but it also serves the aims of the algorithm, which might be to maximize your engagement or to maximize profit for the company. So these algorithms do multiple things at once, but they're interactive, they're iterative, um, and yeah, that's an algorithm. I think algorithms may eventually determine credentials or they may eventually screen who is an appropriate moderator or not. I think algorithms will grow in complexity and in importance as institutions evolve. And then the second type of information that might be on a blockchain or might be coded in is the constitution of the institution. Like what are the roles within the institution? What are the rules? How are those rules enforced? What sort of processes um, aim to preserve uh, due process and protection of justice within the institution? How are the incentives aligned within the institution? All of this stuff is essentially the constitution of how the institution is structured. And then the third type of uh, code or information that could go onto a blockchain is going to be uh, just plain information, but in a lot of ways I think of this as voices explaining the institution. So, for example, if you had a big incident with embezzlement in a company and that embezzlement happened because there was this like loophole in the system where somebody um, could, could take millions of dollars into projects that weren't fully vetted, if that happens and everybody realized, whoops, we d our institution wasn't strong enough to, uh, to withstand someone who was naturally inclined to embezzle, they may develop these processes. Like they may have some rules that say, if you're putting together a project that's over a million dollars, it needs to go through two separate independent committees for approval first. And that would protect against the kind of embezzlement that, that everybody was just so upset about. But of course, as you add rules like this, that also adds red tape. And of course, we know that institutions have a trade-off between agility, like how quickly they can respond to new situations, how quickly they can implement new and innovative ideas. There, there, so there's that trade-off between agility and stability or like um, protection against these problems like embezzlement. And sometimes the institution develops too much red tape and sometimes the institution um, needs sort of a different combination, like small units that are very agile and large processes that protect. And, and all of that kind of stuff, you might imagine, if something like that happens, you want somebody to explain, why did you put this red tape in place in the first place? And this relates to Chesterton's fence. So Chesterton's fence is the notion that if you come across a fence in a field that seems to have no purpose, before you get rid of it, you should find out what was the original purpose of this fence. Because it could be that once every seven years, coyotes come in and this fence protects you know, the town from coyotes. But you wouldn't know that if you haven't been around the town um, for one of those every seven years coyote attacks. And so, um, yeah, Chesterton's fence is the, the notion that sometimes things can seem like they have no purpose, you get rid of it, and then you regret it later. And I think this is a difficult process because a lot of times there's so many ways institutions can go off the rails or have problems, and sometimes you don't experience those problems except for once every 30 years or once every 15 years, such that as there's turnover within the institution, as new leaders move into roles, they forget about those important protective factors. 
And so back to our notion of code as DNA, I think code will help to um, better preserve the parts of the institution that worked well over time. And they will preserve to allow wh when people make changes to an institution, they'll have the full history as, as it's laid out on the blockchain so that they can make better decisions in balancing these trade-offs. So, so yeah, let me just be very specific about the two main benefits that I think blockchain brings to the institutional ecosystem. And both of these are related to the fact that blockchain is immutable. Now, I'll add an asterisk, can you ever change a blockchain? Well, yes, it's complicated, but, but in general, I think you can think of it as it's very, very hard to change blockchains. And especially the farther in the past something is, the harder it is to change. But okay, thinking of blockchain as an immutable ledger, an immutable place to write code and constitutions and all that. Um, one benefit here is that it stops people from hiding rules or guidelines from the past if those guidelines happen to be inconvenient, say, for people in power. So obviously power to the powerful is one of the problems that can happen in institutions where you get people who come along and they're ambitious and they use the institution's uh, processes and structure for their own ends rather than to serve the population it's trying to serve. And if they cannot get rid of a rule because it's it's you know etched in stone on the blockchain, then they can't hide inconvenient rules and get rid of parts of the constitution without people being able to see what's going on. And that's just really powerful as a tool against power to the powerful. And then the second thing that blockchain helps with is it helps us to be able to resurrect code and rules and stuff from the past that we might have gotten rid of without fully knowing the unintended consequences. So let's say like five years ago, everybody changed this rule. We're trying something new. It seems like it's going to work. It was going along fine for a while, but then chaos happens and everyone's like, whoa, those changes actually didn't work out. Um, in which case, you may actually want to rewind and look at what, what was the institutional structure six years ago? And can we resurrect that and make changes starting from six years ago, rather than all of these changes since the five years ago point when, uh, when things ended up unraveling? And there's an evolutionary analogy to this because a lot of times you'll have, you know, a group, a population of organisms that perhaps develops um, like, let, let me just give a specific example. Let's say hamsters are evolving and there's a period in time when there's this really fast predator. So if you're looking at fat hamsters versus thin hamsters, the thin hamsters do really, really well against this predator and they might start to take off in evolutionary terms. But if that one predator dies or goes extinct, then suddenly maybe the fat hamsters are actually better suited to the environment because the fat hamsters, you know, store up fat for the winter and they can survive cold environments better. So maybe the evolutionary process would like to rewind and go back to the fat version of the hamster. And evolution has ways of doing that because, of course, you know, maybe a small tribe of fat hamsters has succeeded and it's still a very small tribe, it's not the majority of hamsters, but once the predator goes extinct, then that, that tribe of fat hamsters is going to like take off at that point. So there is this rewind mechanism in evolution and the fact that blockchain allows better um, and faster and more efficient rewind factors in an evolutionary environment, I think that is so, so important. So yeah, this is one of the reasons I'm very excited about blockchain and we know that our institutions need some strengthening, they need to um, become more robust. There's lots of changes in the system that need to happen and thinking of code as DNA in this evolutionary system I think is a great way of thinking about it.